So Kareem, um, tell me a little bit about where you're from and, and uh, your, your young life. Well, young life is hard to remember. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, my young life, uh, <laughs> I started uh, 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 school at Florida Elementary. It went from the first to the sixth. Mm -hmm. Then I went from, I went to Carver High School, mm -hmm. Carver Corpus, uh, from the seventh to the twelfth grade. And those were kind of memorable times for me. And the most memorable things that I remember, the two things that I remember most about going to school in Memphis was a lady by the name of Miss Gaston. She was my fifth grade teacher. And uh, it was during the time when they first started the IQ test, where you fill in the little, little blocks on the cards. Mm -hmm. And we had did that that year. And like I said, I think that was the first time it actually happened in Memphis. And what grade was this? Fifth. Fifth. And the, my teacher's name was Miss Gaston, G-A-S-T-O-N. And so, boom, next year I was in the sixth grade. And I recall a friend of mine named Van Cabbage. I remember this real vividly. He and I, we were just standing there looking out the window. We wasn't supposed to be. And we saw all these cars pulled up. And uh, all these dudes in suits got out and came into school. And by that time, the teacher saw us at the window and made us sit down. And uh, we learned that the reason that they came to that school it was because Miss Gaston, on, our, on the test that we had took the, the year before, the IQ test, everybody in her fifth grade class scored uh, the IQ had the IQ of a 10th grade student. And they wanted to know what she was doing. And they found out that she was actually teaching us 10th grade work. And they fired her. Yeah, they fired her. And uh, we went home and told our parents about it. And all the mothers in the neighborhood got together, went to the Board of Education, and raised hell until they hired her back. And I remember before, before they hired her, she lived on the same street as the school, I guess about four or five blocks. And we would walk down, and she would be sitting on the porch, and she, she, she looked like she was, it broke her heart what they did. And uh, we, would tell her, we told her that our parents, our mothers were trying to get her job back for her. And uh, eventually they did. And I think she lasted about, she wasn't a real old lady, but she died a couple of years after that, and we all felt that she died from a broken heart. And then uh, what, they, what, what these uh, people did, they were from, some branch of the federal government. And uh, normally, when you go from the first to the sixth grade, they keep that class together. Mm -hmm. So that class, you know, it follows everybody's together, go to the sixth grade. But once you go to the seventh grade over in high school, junior high and high school, they split that class up. But for our particular class, what they did, they made it a case study because uh, the thought was among some that black kids could not, you know, comprehend as well as white kids. And so uh, we had scored, all of, everybody in the class that scored had the IQ equivalents of a 10th grade student because of the work we were being taught. And I think that was evidence that we could comprehend pretty good. And so they kept that class together from the seventh grade all the way through to the 12th as a case study. And how I found out that it was, a, uh, it was actually a case study, by the time we got to the eighth grade, we realized that our class was still together, and everybody, all the other classes, they was, you know, split up. You might be here, he might be there. So that's a kind of segregation still. Right, right, I mean, right. They're, they're, they're keeping you guys together. Right, right. And so it was uh, my eighth grade teacher, we asked him about it, and he was the one that told us that uh, we were actually, you know, uh, I guess like a, 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 la a, a laboratory a test tube <laughs> that they were using us as a case study. So that class actually did stay together all the way through the 12th grade. And uh, one thing that was kind of unique about it was that uh, most of the boys in the class uh, were engineer majors and, and become engineers and, uh, or, or lawyers. Wow. Yeah. And I actually uh, was inclined to an engineer myself. Uh, and I actually worked here in Nashville for Temtex Products and started out as an industrial mechanic, and I made my way to the engineering department, you know, as well as uh, a lot of my uh, 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 friends that were in that class with me, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, and matter of fact, and, and then I said uh, engineers and lawyers 
and I actually ended up uh, studying law and was a paralegal also, so I got a little of both of them. Tell me a little bit about your, um, your home life growing up. Uh, home life. Well, my family, my mother and father, it was my mother, father, and five of us kids. I had a, a brother and three sisters. And uh, we were poor people. We didn't have a lot of money. And my, but my father, father and mother, they worked. And coming up, you know, usually when you get around in about the fourth, fifth grade, everybody go to asking you, the teachers, uh, what you want to be when you grow up? And so I, it, it was kind of puzzling to me that both my parents worked every day, but we were poor, and I couldn't figure that out. And so I used to look around the neighborhood, and uh, to me, one of the most successful people in the neighborhood was a, was a male man. <laughs> and so he stayed right across from us, and uh, uh, in the back of my mind, I said, yeah, that's what I want to be, a male man, you know. But my uh, parents and uncles, my father's brother and my mother's brother, for some reason, they were uh, 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 constantly uh, pounding in me the engineering thing. And maybe that's where that actually come from. But yeah, uh, it, they would be in the living room arguing. I'd be listening to them. I said, I'm going to be whatever I want to be. I, was, I, was, I had that rebellious, I guess, of from course. the six. Everyone the six does. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and so uh, 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 I guess, but I guess what they finally, uh, I guess it just soaked in, you know, because when I got to high school, in the 10th grade, we had to pick out a uh, uh, major. And one of the things that I, uh, the category that I picked was industrial arts major. And as an industrial arts major, you studied drafting, you studied, uh, you learned how to weld, you learned a lot of uh, industrial type things. So it's kind of like a technical, like a, like a technical school. Exactly. Like we learned a lot of technical trades. In, in high school, I learned how to weld. I learned a little bit about electricity. Uh, and I have worked as an electrician before here, too, <laughs> also. Right. So uh, uh, my education, it, it paid off, I guess, in the long run, you know. And we took, uh, we become pretty good draftsmen. Mm -hmm. then, you know, now they got CAD, uh, computer aid drafting. But we had to do it the old-fashioned way with the drafting board and, and a, a pencil pen and, and, a, yeah, yeah. and a whole nine And guys. an eraser, a right, big eraser. Right, right, right. But we got real good uh, after about two years of drafting. We were, we were actually, uh, we could design dyes and stuff, you know. But now with the CAD thing, uh, you know, they may not even have to take a whole lot of math now, you know, but we had to go as far as you could go, calculus, calculus one, two, and right. all that stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess my uh, schooling paid off in the long run because the uh, uh, jobs that I've always had was directly related to industrial stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Or so, law, other law. Yeah, yeah, or law. <laughs> so um, you told me some interest. You told me a, an interesting story on the way here about uh, your where your family and where where they came from. Yeah, my father. My father was uh, uneducated. He could barely read and write. Matter of fact, he could barely write his name. And he was elated when I was going to school because when I was in about the third grade, I was we had learned script writing real good, and I was a junior. Uh, before I had my name changed, my name was Willie Glenzer Jr. And so any time that his signature was needed, <laughs> he would give it to me. Junior signed that. And so on a lot of his documents, is actually my signature. And so my father uh, was from Mississippi. And uh, he used to tell us all the time, not in depth, but he used to mention Mound Bayou, Mississippi. And he used to tell us, he used to tell me mostly, because I was the oldest boy, uh, that we are Geeches. He said, don't you forget that, we Geeches. And I, didn't, and I thought, you know, Geeches was some slang thing that they were using, but I come to find out that it was actually uh, uh, an African tribe that originated from, I think, the Gula people or something, and that it wasn't just a slang thing. You know, it actually was a group of people that called themselves Geeches. And so I started, and, and, but he never told me a lot about Mound Bayou. And so after I got old, <laughs> after I basically lived my life, uh, as a Muslim, there's a, a brother in the mass yet that I go to that's actually from Mississippi, and he's older than I am. And uh, Mississippi come up one morning after we had prayed, and uh, I mentioned about Mound Bayou, and he knew all about Mound Bayou. 
and the history of Mount Bayou and my family is simply that I had got my two great uncles, Isaac Montgomery and Benjamin Green. They were slaves on uh, Jefferson Davis' plantation, who was the president of the South during the Civil War. And uh, Isaac was kind of smart. And so. Like you? Well. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, uh, it was Jefferson Davis' older brother who was actually running the show. He was, he was, he was, after I researched it, I found out that his older brother was the one that was uh, pushing Jefferson Davis through the military and made him pursue the political career, career to where he become president of, uh, of the South. And, but all, all this time, their plantation, uh, his, uh, his brother uh, had my uncle, who was, he figured to be kind of smart. He first had him and designated him the job to keep up with everything like a bookkeeper. And so he was keeping up with everything on the plantation. And uh, eventually he told him, said, what I want you to do, I want you to actually manage and run the whole plantation. And he did that for a while and evidently he was doing a pretty good job. And so uh, he went to uh, Jefferson Davis' brother and told him, said, look, said, you know, I got an idea. And he told him, well, you know my cousin, Benjamin, who was one of my uncles, great uncles, I guess, he said, well, I figured out how much he's worth to you each month. He said, I want to pay you his worth each month so I can get him to run a little store here on the plantation. So the people will have something, they can come to my store and his store and, and buy things. Sort of a commissary. Type right, thing. like a little commissary, yeah, canteen type thing. And so uh, they agreed to that. And uh, they were doing pretty good, I guess. And uh, uh, Jefferson Davis' brother came back to him later and told him, said, look, you know we have another plantation, so what I want you to do is run both of them. And he did. But by the end of the Civil War, they had uh, accumulated three plantations, and the Civil War was over with. And uh, my uncles, they ended up purchasing all three plantations from Jefferson Davis and his family. His idea was to create a African community so that the free slave would have their own little community. And they did that. And they were doing well for a time, and they were off into cotton. And something happened to the cotton industry. I don't know exactly what it was. And it kind of went bust. And so they started looking for uh, another place. And uh, they had, and, 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 I, and as I researched, I found out that the Geechee people, they have, I guess, it may be some genetic thing in them of creating this uh, community for them. Mm -hmm. And so they were coming up south of the Mississippi, headed toward Memphis, but they was following the Mississippi River. And they got to this swamp land. And uh, I guess they were real smart. They figured out a way to take the water off the swamp land. And they didn't tell nobody, but they went and bought the swamp land from the white people. And then drained it. Yeah, I could imagine the people saying, yeah, I wish I had more swamp land to sell these folks. You know, and, uh, but they were able to drain the water off the swamp land. And a lot of them migrated on them to Memphis. And on the weekends, they would catch the train from Memphis headed south and get off there. And all of them would work the land and do whatever it was they was doing. And eventually, they developed a town an all-black city, and they named it Mound Bayou, Mississippi. It's still there today. And, and you visited it, I right? visited it about five years ago. Me and a couple of Muslim friends of mine, we had a little caravan, and the imam, he was, uh, 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 he's like the you know, preacher of a church or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's from Memphis like I am also. And he said, man, we got to go down there because it was the first uh, African-American city. He said, this should be in every history book, but we don't know nothing about it, you know? And so we had a little care of it. We called in uh, the mayor's office, and we had an appointment set up to meet the mayor and whatnot. And so we eventually went down there and uh, met with the mayor. Well, when we first got off, the, the place where we all stopped and parked at, just so happened the fellow that was there, he was uh, Emmett Till's cousin. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he told us a lot about the city before we even met the mayor. And he told us that during the Civil uh, Rights Movement, that's where Mecca Evers and all of them would come and meet because they would be safe in Mountain Bayou. And I found out that 
Isaac Montgomery, my great great cousin, uh, uncle, that one of the founders of Mount Bayou, he and Frederick Douglass had a big falling out. He's just, I didn't know it, but he's kind of famous himself. And the thing was that uh, during, I guess, the 1800s, early 1900s, they had developed some kind of uh, agreement, I guess with state officials or something, that they could actually had been voting back then. But my uncle didn't want to do that. He said that his first priority with his people was their security. And so they went into an agreement that uh, the city limits of Mountain Bayou was off limit to any white folks. And so that was like a, a, a side of them. A safe place. A safe place yeah. for black people. And there was a fellow here in Nashville. He and I are the same age, and he's from Mount Bayou. And he used to tell me that when he used to get in trouble, he would race to get to Mount Bayou because once he, once he, he know he made it home to Mount Bayou, he was safe. Wow. Yeah, so uh, Mount Bayou was a safe haven. And so we went there, and uh, we met with the mayor. We stayed in her office about two hours. She was telling a little history herself about the city. And there's only about 1,500 people that live there now. A uh, city has no industry or nothing like a lot of small cities in uh, you know United States. They are just whistling or whittling away. But I got a chance to see uh, the first black bank because them being a city, and and Mount Bayou at one time produced the best cotton in the world. It was Theodore Roosevelt, I think, one of those Roosevelts, uh, Theodore's, went down there and he named Mount Bayou Queen of the Delta. Because oh, wow. they produce the best cotton in the world, you know. And uh, as the mayor, uh, they had a female mayor at the time we visited, and she told us they was proud to work there. She grew up in the cotton fields, and she eventually, you know, went to college and very successful lady. But she was telling us how proud they were because the cotton that they was producing was their cotton, you know. And I thought about that. I said, yeah, that's because as a youth coming up in the 60s, with a lot of militant uh, groups around me, you know, I had determined I'll ne never work a per uh, nobody's cotton field. Right. But then I thought, I said, well, it's kind of a different story. It's, if, if it's you, your own. If it's your own, you know. So do they still produce cotton? Uh, I don't know. Uh, just like I say, the city needs a lot of help, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it probably needs somebody to come down and regenerate the cotton mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. you know. So if I happen to stumble up on a little cash, that's a thought that I've had. Find somebody who knows how to get grants and try right. to get federal help to, right, right, to do that. Right, because I, I was thinking that if it once was the queen of the Delta because it produced the greatest, the best cotton in the world, it could probably do it again. It's got the same, same, same soil as soil. Yeah. Right. So you, uh, you talked a little bit um, yesterday about, um, about your neighborhood and who is your neighbor. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, about um, group that was living behind you uh, well, in the I went 60s. To, yeah, yeah. I went to Cobb High School. And uh, directly behind the school, matter of fact, uh, a hole had been cut in the fence. I'm not going to say I cut the hole. Uh, and <laughs> directly, behind it, directly behind it was uh, the clubhouse to the Black Invaders. Now, the Black Invaders was an offshoot of the Panthers. And they were the militant group in Memphis. That was, uh, you know, they stood out and talked on the corners, and I think their spokesman, his name was Sweet Willow Wine. <laughs> he was, he was, he was, uh, all, you know, like I said, he was in my neighborhood. And uh, 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 there was a time in the early 70s when they was actually looking for Angela Davis. They thought she was there. And uh, I'm not going to say she was there or not, because it still might be a warrant out for somebody that was harboring her. But, uh, uh, yeah, the, vac the, black in the Black Invaders, they were directly behind our high school, and they were instrumental in, uh, in, 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 in stirring up the emotions of the people and getting them to uh, fight for their rights. And I remember the day that uh, uh, when Martin Luther King came to Memphis, you know, that's where he was assassinated. I remember that day very well. Uh, the second time he came, and they were marching down Main Street, uh, for some reason, I don't know what, what it was. Everybody in, at Carver High, we just went out on the front, on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, the street that the school was on, and we just marched down Pennsylvania Avenue, went down Parkway to Florida, went down Florida to Crump, and went down Crump Street to Main Street. And by the time we got to Main Street, we were at the end of the uh, marches. 
And that's when that big riot broke out, you know. And uh, it was a few weeks behind that that uh, Martin Luther King come back and was speaking at the church. And it was, uh, I'll never forget that day also. This day, I guess every radio in the city of Memphis was listening to the speech. Uh, every car radio, because there were several of us standing outside the church. And uh, you could hear the speech. You could be walking down the street and hear it. Because every radio was Every tuned. radio, I guess, in the city was playing that speech. And we found out that he was going to be staying at the Lorraine Motel, and we couldn't figure that out. This is a place that I wouldn't have stayed, you know. And the, uh, Why is that? Well, it was just a rundown place that uh, had a lot of prostitution going on and whatnot. And it was just, you know, it was just a place that, I, like I said, I, I wouldn't have stayed. And the uh, uh, invaders, they wanted to set him up in the Sheraton Hotel. And that's the hotel you've probably seen it on the news or something, where the ducks walk across the street. Oh, the yeah, Peabody. The Peabody. The Peabody. Peabody. That's yeah, what it is, yeah. right. And so, but uh, there were some people in Martin Luther King's entourage that uh, didn't, have, want, didn't have, want to have no dealings with the invaders because they represented violence, and it was a peace movement. And so they stayed there in the Lorraine Motel, and we know, what, what, we know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Mm -hmm. But I often wondered, had they went to the Peabody and permitted the invaders to uh, provide them security, you know, who knows? We would be in a different world. It may be. Yeah. You know, or it may be just divine destiny that it was his time to go. And that what happened happened, you know. So you mentioned um, paralegal. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, um, your your time well, and how, how, you, I, how you got how into I, that. How I had to start studying law, it was a, a, a great necessity. I had no choice. I, had, I was out of high school. I, I got out of high school when I was 17 years old. And uh, friends of mine from the old neighborhood... One of the fellows I had lent some money. And these, these group of dudes, they were robbing everything in town. That's what they was doing. And uh, 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 the fellow that owed me some money, he paid me. And they eventually got caught. And they was, the police asked, well, they want to know, as many places as y'all robbed, what are y'all doing with all this money? You know, this we talking about 1969. At the time, you know, uh, you could take $10,000 and go buy Cadillac cash. So if you done got several thousand dollars out liquor stores in different places. They wanted to know, what are y'all doing with this money? And so uh, this friend of mine, he told them that he had paid me some money. So I was at home at my parents' house in the bed sleep, but holy, the police came and arrested me and uh, took me downtown. And these, there were about like 36 armed robber charges. And so I knew I had not committed down, so I agreed to go on the lineup. And to do that, you have to sign a lineup, a waiver card, a little index card. So I signed it. I don't care. And so we went on lineups, oh, I'm telling you, day and night, day and night, for about two or three days. We hadn't seen a lawyer or nothing, you know. No one was permitted to see us. And uh, no one could pick me out of a lineup because I hadn't done anything. And I thought they would just let me go. But they continued to process me along with the other dudes because several of them had confessed. And what they had actually done... I eventually proved it. Uh, they had took my signature from my lineup card, took one of the dudes' typewritten statements, and photostatic photographed it on a copy machine several times till you couldn't see the lines, and said this was a statement that I had given. And I'm constantly telling them, I didn't give them no statement because I hadn't did anything. And so they took us to trial, and I ended up with a 12-year sentence. And so while in jail, like I said, my people were poor, couldn't afford to get me an attorney or nothing. And I would eventually run across little law books here, little law books there. Were, there were fellows coming from the prison system going back to court, and they would have little uh, binders and whatnot. And Memphis State, they had a law school, and I wrote them, and they would send me little paperback uh, supplements before they get, after they got put into a hard binder. And so from them, I started studying the law. And I learned enough of the law, constitutional law, to figure out how I could get my case in court. Because my attorney that I went to trial with, I stayed in jail for 36 months, and I never saw him, not one time. And that was bef before you went to court. Right, right, right. I never saw him, but I, I'm, I'm writing letters. You know, I need to talk to you. We got a trial date set. And I never saw the man. I didn't know what he looked like until I went to court. 
And he took me to trial, and, and, and I was watching him, and I sensed that he knew that had he prepared to take me to trial to represent me, he probably could have beat the case, you know. So the only time I was, my, my name was actually mentioned was when the witnesses, the victims, got on the uh, witness stand, and, and they was asked, uh, there was six of us sitting there, uh, and they would ask, could you identify this defendant? Could you identify this? And they get to me, no, 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 no. So that was doing a, a four-day trial. And this is a trial just for you. It wasn't a No, no, trial. no. That was another issue that I brought up in court. These dudes were pleading guilty. And so I had, like I said, I learned quite a bit about the law. And so I filed a motion for a severance. I said, I need a trial by myself. These dudes are saying that they did this. I'm saying I didn't. And it's going to prejudice me to be sitting in the courtroom with them. And, but they denied my motion for severance. So I went to trial, believe it or not, <laughs> with a group of dudes. Three of them out of six of us were saying that they did, that they had their written confessions and statements. And they was, was pleading guilty. And they were, uh, uh, they were uh, telling the jury, well, now these three here on the L, we just want y'all to fix their sentence at the end. But these are their co-defendants sitting here with us. So naturally, that was prejudicial. And another issue that uh, I put in the petition that I eventually got to federal court was that by these dudes pleading guilty and me sitting there with them in court in trial, it was prejudicial to me. So I should have had the opportunity to cross-examine them. And so they violated my confrontation clause of the Sixth Amendment. So that was another. I had several real good issues. And it took uh, years to get the case all the way through state court so I could file a federal habeas corpus in the uh, Western District there in Memphis. And when I did, uh, I was granted a hearing, which was kind of un very unusual. So I knew I had to have a pretty good case. Why, why was that unusual? Well, uh, they just didn't do it. You had to, you know, for a state prisoner to get a, to file a federal habeas corpus in, in federal court and they give you a hearing, it just, you know, it was just very unusual. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had to have a pretty good case. And, and so they appointed an attorney his name was Ewell B. Adams, and he was right out of law school, didn't know nothing. <laughs> so he, he had a copy of the petition that I had handwritten on onion skin paper because I had to send three copies over there. So I had gotten some carbon paper and, you know. and Did so he, tracing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he uh, come with the petition with all the law and the arguments and everything in it. And I told him, I said, look, he told me that he was right out of law school. He had never, you know, represented anybody. And so I told him, I said, look. I said, you go and read this thoroughly. And I said, all those cases that's been cited within the petition, you go pull them off the shelf and read them. And I told him that anything else that you find that might be helpful, you can supplement it with this. But I said, don't change nothing. I said, if you don't change nothing, we got to want them. And so we, we, we had a two-day hearing in federal court, and he did quite well. And we proved that uh, the uh, statement that they had said was mine, was actually an identical statement. What we did, we had a, uh, what you call it, the machine? Uh, uh, a slide projector? Uh, yeah, yeah. And we took both statements and put them together, and they were identical, every period, every, everything. And, you know, it was, and, and they, had told the they had told the court that we were all in separate rooms giving them them statements, and they was typing them down. And so the attorney asked, them, asked the detective, said, you mean... Uh, could they hear each other? No, no, we had them separated. So you mean he said the identical same thing that on his statement that that one said. And y'all put the period at the same place too. So we proved, and they couldn't produce the original signature, the original copy of the statement with the original signature on it. And so we knew, we, we, like I said, we, technically we won the case. But Judge Brown, his ruling was that he was going to let the Sixth Circuit deal with it. Uh, Knock it upstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had to appeal through the Sixth Circuit. And in 74, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that as far as the defendant, Glenzer, is concerned, which was me, that the evidence was insufficient. But I wanted them to rule on some of the other issues, too. But once, once they ruled on insufficiency of the evidence, that meant that there was no need to rule on anything else. And so I had to uh, uh, file up another petition for the trial court where I was tried at to bring me back to court and dismiss that case pursuant to the uh, decision of the Sixth Circuit. So that's how I kind of learned to be a paralegal. So how long, how long were you incarcerated? Uh, about five years. Wow. And uh, what I did, 
I made a, a well, sort of an off the, off the record deal with the governor that if he let my co-defendants go, that I wouldn't file a lawsuit. And he let all my co-defendants go. You know. The ones who originally committed the yeah, crime? Yeah, yeah, including the ones that, uh, yeah, yeah, the ones that got caught. Because mo- all of them had uh, 25-year sentences. Yeah. Were you friends with them while you were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, at, uh, let's see, it was, uh, I think, two of us at the same institution. I was out here at the main prison, the old castle here in Nashville at the old oh, walls. Wow. Oh, horrible, horrible, horrible. Oh, that's horrible. a horrible place. It is. And, then, you know, when I think about it now, I don't know. It's like living literally in a cave. Two men. You can't stretch your arms out. The cells are so small. In the summertime, no air at all. You know, uh, and uh, when I think about it now, I, I can't, I don't understand. I, I don't know how we made it, you know. It, they film a lot of movies Yeah. now there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, did they, I think they did the Shawshank Report. Part of the, either the Shawshank Redemption or there was another prison movie around that. Same I know time. Uh, they did. Well, I know uh, uh, what's his name, the comedian, black dude. Uh, I know he did a couple movies there, and they did the movie uh, on Sis, uh, Sister Spacek was in the movie. Marie Majani, she was the one that turned in Governor Blanton for selling uh, uh, pardons. And so they did a movie on her. And that's Sister, very relevant now too. Yeah, yeah. And Sister Spacek <laughs> played her. And I remember that uh, 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 there in front of the, the dining room was a building where the electric chair used to be. We called it Unit 6. And it was one, after, one evening, they was serving the last meal. And uh, she, <laughs> they had the crew out there, her bodyguards and everything. And a fella come running around the corner from one of the other dorms, bleeding, and another dude behind him chasing him with a knife. And at first, they thought that it was part of the the movie? The movie, but once they realized that this was the real deal, uh, they rushed up through the gates. Oh, my gosh. You know. So um, you um, mentioned you changed your name. Yeah. Uh, you you, you uh, transformed into Islam. Tell yeah, me I, about that. Uh, well, actually, when we were growing up, like I said, there were five of us, and our mother had told us that she was not going to impose any religion upon us that if we wanted to go to church or whatever, do that. But she wanted us to study all religions. And uh, whatever we choose to do, be the best in it. And so uh, it was, it was uh, back then, <laughs> if you had a set of encyclopedias, you was doing real good. And my mother, she uh, uh, was constantly on my father about getting us a set of encyclopedias. And when we did, I was sitting in the middle of the floor, and I went from A all the way to Z. I didn't read every single page, but that was my uh, leisure time for me. Mm-hmm. And she asked me one day, I was sitting there with, on the, in the middle of the floor with several books out, and she asked me about uh, what was I, I said, well, I've been reading about these religions. And I told her, I said, I kind of think that all of them are the same, that they're just putting different names and labels. I said, it's the labels that's got you know, everybody separated. And it was a verse, two verses that appeared in the Quran. It said, Oh, ye Muslims, Jews, or Christians, or those who call themselves Sabians, any who believe in God in the last day and is a doer of good shall have his reward with his Lord. And so that's what made me accept Islam because uh, not what them dudes are doing over in the Middle East, but what the book said. That uh, it was regardless to, it's regardless to God what you call yourself. If you believe in him and you're doing good, you know, uh, you'll have your, your, your favor with your Lord. Mm-hmm. And so that was, uh, all the rest of them were saying, if you, wasn't, you don't believe in Jesus or pray to Jesus, you're going to go to hell. If you don't do this, you're going to hell. Uh, this. But uh, that was uh, something that uh, kind of touched me. I think there's extremist. In every religion. It is. And that is, it is what divides people. It is. And over the years, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> like I said, I've been a Muslim now for, I guess, what, 50 some years. And uh, I taught myself to read the Arabic and uh, the Quranic Arabic so that I can uh, 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 see. I, I had this thing about an author or someone who transliterated from Arabic to English, let's say, A. Yusuf Ali. I said, these words that I'm reading is what he 
yeah, his interpretation. From, right, yeah. if, right. I said, I want to know what God is saying to me. I said, if these, if the Arabic is God's word, I want him to tell me what's going on. <laughs> I don't want to hear it through no second hand. And so, uh, and, and there's a couple of verses in the Quran where it says, this is an Arabic Quran, easy to understand. And so uh, I said, God don't tell lies. I said, so let me see, can I learn this Arabic? And I found out it was easy. It wasn't difficult at all. And so I began to study the Quran from the Arabic script. And a lot of people from the Middle East and different things, I know Muslims from everywhere now, and uh, uh, we get to talk about a particular subject matter. And they say, how do you know that? You know, I said, well, you know, it's in the book. And uh, I, I made the statement a lot of times. I said, they need to bring some of them fellows over in the Middle East over here so we can teach them this religion, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, in, in actuality, uh, uh, I've done just that, you know, because I learned that. And I couldn't figure out, these dudes speak Arabic as their first language. But the Arabic in the Quran is called classical Arabic. And a lot of them don't know it. And so they are afraid. They're just repeating what they hear. Rather right. Than Some really sheikhs in a shade tree with a long beard and told them this, and that's yeah. what they go on. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, that has, that's, that's why I, uh, I've been a Muslim a long time. And uh, it's my understanding from the book itself that we're all the same people. You know, we just put different labels on it. You know, I'm from the north, you from the south, uh, He's from the West Coast. He's from the East Coast. Any way that could divide. It's or, these labels that we us put versus on. them. It's these or labels whatever. we put on each other. Yeah. To do it. And you know, uh, uh, I look at the same thing in, in regard to school systems. And back to in my day when all the schools were segregated, uh, there was no need. It's like I say the labels. I'm black. He's white. You know, they are Latinos, and it's the labels we do, and we're doing it to each other, and hopefully uh, somewhere along the line we can come across something that will unite us, right? you know, so we don't have to worry about uh, integration or segregation or desegregation or any of that stuff because I, we are, we are we're literally all the same people. I, uh, I was very privileged to have a family that didn't see that, 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 yeah. that didn't see color. Well, uh -huh. I used to ask my mother during the 60s when they were having all the stuff down in Alabama and Mississippi, and I've seen them putting dogs on black people, and uh, I was asking, I was questioning her about it, and she said, uh, there are just people that don't understand. And she taught us, they are no better than you, and you are no better than them. And uh, those things that my wise mother taught us, she, was a, she, she did well with us. Uh, and the shortcomings we have is our own, but she taught us well. I think I'm very privileged to know you. I'm privileged to know you, you too, Phil. Uh, you, you have. <laughs> um, I'm very privileged to be in the in the in the in the job that I'm in, and yeah. um, I think that this is what makes me want to go to work is <laughs> is, is conversation when I have to look at finances and <laughs> spreadsheets all day. The way that I re regenerate myself is coming out and, and talking to all of you guys. Well, the first time I went to Capitol Hill with you and Miss K, ma'am, I come back and I told all the fellows. You know, I said, man, uh, we got somebody speaking out for us. I said, Miss Kay, I said, you see her around, she's just as nice and polite and soft. I said, when she get there in Capitol Hill, she's like a pit bull at them senators. Yep, <laughs> she is. She has taught me a lot. Uh, so uh, you and the yeah. staff there, man, y'all are uh, real special to us, you know, yeah, <laughs> at the Dismas House. Y'all yeah. real special. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Questions. Um, one, only because of the focus of the project, I'm just curious. Um, we heard a lot of people today speak about the integration of, of Memphis public schools around the time when you would have been attending, and it sounds like maybe you attended all black schools? All black schools. I, uh, I know about the, uh, what, Memphis 13? Yeah, I'm curious. And, and, and the thing remember. about that, the thing about that is that happened in 1961. I come out of high school in 1970. And the school, you would, you would have thought that because of the Memphis 13, that from that point on, the schools would have been desegregated. But they weren't. They wasn't. Uh, it was not until 1973 that they issued a federal order that I think uh, made them start busing people and desegregated schools. All the uh, elementary schools I went to was all black. The high school I went to was all black. Not only was the students all black, but all the teachers was black also, you know. So uh, 
uh, that's something that I, you know, couldn't figure out. Uh, you know, we had a law that passed in 61, and Brown versus uh, the Board of Education and all those things, but no one was enforcing any of it. And one of the main issues when I was coming up was that uh, there was a difference in the text books that we had. And uh, had we, uh, the thing was, it, it was kind of simple. All it had to do was just give the black students the same textbooks that the white students had. And it was the teachers that knew that there were differences in the books. You know, I never seen a white student's book versus what I had, but the teachers knew that the books that the white students had were different than ours. And uh, like I said, the incident when I was in the fifth grade, I kind of think that kind of proved that uh, we had the capability to comprehend. Then plus I can rely on my old smart uncles also. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there, I guess just to follow up to that, um, what do you remember just about the, the climate or the discussion around integration? Well, uh, were there people that were against it, or even within the black community? Yes, yes, it was. Uh, uh, we need to be with our people, they need to be with their people, and you know, you, you know racism existed on, all, on both sides, you know, truthfully, that's the truth. And uh, there were a few uh, black people, African Americans, that wanted to keep things segregated, you know. They, they, they were satisfied with, satisfied with it. Uh, and I remember uh, I was out of high school at the time in 73 when they started the busing situation, but I had uh, two younger sisters, uh, and they didn't have to get involved in the busing because we had moved in a different neighborhood, and they were going to Central High. And Central High there in Memphis was uh, already integrated, you know. And so uh, I never, other than what I saw on the news, and I, you see people, they were voicing their opinions that they didn't want the blacks mixing with the whites and the whites mixing with the blacks. And to me, it was all stupid, you know. But uh, I grew up, uh, went to school, and uh, all black schools, all black, you know, so. But I, but 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 I do remember one thing. I think me and Phil was talking about it. It was in like six to eight. I played football. That's why my knee is tore up now. Uh, here in Nashville, in about two thousand, I think like thirteen, I was sitting over in Centennial Park, and this fellow just so happened to walk up and asked me some directions about something, and he was here from Seattle to uh, enroll his daughter in Vanderbilt University. And I, told, and I talked to him, and I was telling him I was from Memphis. He's, he's originally from Memphis. And I told him, and we got to talking about football or something. And the first black uh, school that played a white school in Memphis was the school I went to and Messick, Carver versus Messick. And come to find out, his father, who worked with the Board of Education, was over all the, uh, uh, the, the school uh, uh, sports and he was the one that arranged that. And he, he was at the game. He was a little bit of boy, he said. But he said his father made sure he took him to that game because it was going to be making history. When Carver played Messick, he was the first uh, black high school to play another white high school in football. And that was like in 68. And so I told him, I said, uh, when you, and I asked him about his father. He said he was still living and he was in Seattle, Washington. I said, when you get home, man, tell him I said thank you. <laughs> and were you there for that game? Concert? Yeah, yeah, do you, yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember the game well. <laughs> so you played in the game? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you played? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Well, we won the game, and uh, uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> you just say that so so nonchalant. Yeah, well, we won the game, and uh, 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 I felt uh, kind of bad even after winning the game because a lot of the black players kind of took their frustration out of some of those white dudes. There were several broken arms that shouldn't have been. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, yeah. And uh, even though we won again, I felt bad about it. And I told some of them about it, too. You know, yeah. But uh, that was the first, uh, that was the first uh, black-white high school football game. And it was an all-black team and all-white team? Yeah. I bet the, I bet the, I bet the fans were going crazy. Uh 
I don't know. It was, it was, it was kind of sober, actually. Oh? You know, when some of those players was being taken off the field, you know, with the arm broke or leg broke or something, you know. And like I said, I, I, I didn't like it, you know, because I believed in a, a – I was a small dude, but I could play good. And uh, uh, before I got my knee toe up. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I just – I was – you know, I just didn't like it, you know. And as a matter of fact, I told the coach, some, one of the coaches about it too. I didn't like it. I said, we come to play ball. We got better skills to them, so there was no need, no, no need to uh, attempt to hurt them. And we wasn't a real good football team now. In basketball and baseball, we was the best in the city. But football, we was garbage. <laughs> but we did win that game. <laughs> um, my last question for you, uh, so it, your, your family had a hand, it sounds like, in creating Mound Bayou, mm-hmm. which was a refuge yeah. for many people. Right. What, what refuges, do you, refuges do you have in your life now? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, uh, you're a producer. Okay, good. You know, like they did uh, the movie on uh, 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 Malcolm X. Mm-hmm. That'd probably be a good movie to do, The History of Mount Bayou. You see, you start from, from, from the plantation with the, my two uncles, you know, and that, look, that little history and come all the way up and, you know, that probably make a good series, you know. Remember me, at least let me give me an autograph or something. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> I actually thought about that. And my youngest sister, she graduated from UT. She has a degree in journalism. And uh, I thought about uh, trying to get, get her to, and I, I write pretty good. Matter of fact, I'm writing stories, some Islamic stories now for uh, Professor uh, Hannibal. He teaches at uh, Fisk University. He's a Muslim. And, He's do he doing uh, uh, Muslim newsletters, and so I'm writing articles for him. And uh, I actually thought about uh, 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 doing a uh, thing for a movie, and I think that's probably make a good movie. So uh, you make sure I get your autograph. <laughs> so from StoryCorps to, <laughs> to big budget. To <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it would really, you know, because the thing about it. Mount Value, like, like uh, 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 Imam Yusuf says, he said that should be in every history book. And the place is still there right now today. You can Google Mount Value, Mississippi, and you can get the whole history off of it, you know. And, 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 it's, and, and I think uh, uh, the story needs to be told. And so we are designating you as the person. <laughs> <laughs> There's an American experience in on that, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs>